about passive transport across a membrane using facilitated transport as well as active transport. In passive transport across a membrane um, or facilitated transport, the movement of the solute and the direction of the movement through the transport protein is driven entirely by the solute's concentration gradient. So passive transport is also called facilitated diffusion. The solute simply binds to the passive transport protein. The protein releases it to the other side of the membrane. A glucose transporter is an example of, passport, of a passive transport protein. This protein changes shape when it binds to the molecule of glucose. The shape changes moves the solute to the opposite side of the membrane where it detaches from the transport protein. Then the transporter reverts to its original shape. Now some of these passive transporters don't change shape. They're permanently open. Um, they are channels through a membrane. Others are gated, which means they open and close in response to a stimulus such as a shift in the electrical charge or binding of a signaling molecule. Let's take a look at this in the McGraw-Hill. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule, such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. Facilitated diffusion can occur in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. If there is a higher concentration of the particular molecule inside the cell, the same carrier protein would then transport the molecules out of the cell. Okay, so stop the video and explain how polar water can rapidly move across the nonpolar plasma mem membrane and then contrast diffusion with facilitated transport. Once you've taken a few minutes to answer this, you can start the video again. And we continue with active transport across a membrane. With active transport, we have a few characteristics. One, the molecules are going to move against their concentration gradient. That means they're going to go from a low concentration area to a high concentration area. This is facilitated by carrier proteins, and it requires the expenditure of energy in the form of ATP. An example of this is the sodium-potassium pump, which uses ATP to move sodium ions out of the cells and potassium ions into the cell against their concentration gradients. Here we have the sodium-potassium, and you see the car carrier has it. This is a carrier protein. It has a shape that allows it to take up to three sodiums. The sodiums are the squares. They fit into the areas. Um, then ATP binds to the molecule and splits where the phosphate group is, a change to the, um, is attached to the carrier. When the phosphate group is attached to the carrier, it changes shape and opens on the opposite side of the cell um, and allows the sodium ions to leave. In fact, the shape of the um, sodium uh, ion binding sites changes slightly so that they are released. On the other side of the cell, then, you have um, potassium ions that can bind to the potassium binding sites, and there are two of those. They bind to the site, and when they bind to the site, the shape of the molecule changes slightly, again, expelling the phosphate molecule. When the phosphate molecule is expelled, the shape changes once again, back to the original shape, expelling the potassium ions inside the cell. So this will transport sodium ions out, potassium ions in, against a concentration gradient, using the energy from ATP. And so now we will look at how this works in an animation on McGraw-Hill. The 
The sodium-potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell, and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions, and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel, and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape, and as a result, the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That is to say, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. Now let's take another look at this um, using a specialized thing called co-transport, uh, which is used for sugars and amino acids. Small molecules, such as sugars and amino acids, can be transported up a concentration gradient. The sugar moves via a membrane transport protein from outside of the cell where the sugar concentration is low to the inside of the cell where the sugar concentration is high. The transport of the sugar through a coupled transport protein is driven by the movement of counter ions such as sodium ions or protons that are moving down their concentration gradients from a region of high to low concentration. Sodium ions and the specific sugar or amino acid simultaneously bind to the same transmembrane protein on the outside of the cell called a symport. When the counter ion is sodium, the low concentration of sodium on the inside of the cell required to transport the sugar is maintained by the sodium-potassium pump, which is powered by ATP. In a related process called counter-transport, the inward movement of sodium ions is coupled with the outer movement of another substance such as calcium ions. As in co-transport, the sodium ions and the other substance bind to the same transport protein called the antiport, but in this case they bind on opposite sides of the membrane and are moved in opposite directions. The low internal sodium ion concentration is maintained by the sodium-potassium pump. And so through these examples, you can see that active transport is necessary, although it's not directly involved in sim transport and anti-transport. Um, but you have the sodium-potassium pump that maintains that high um, concentration gradient that allows it to drive the symport and anti-port functions. We talked about um, moving ions and moving small things. Let's talk about macromolecules. Macromolecules are transported in or out of the cell inside vesicles, inside something called bulk transport. We talked about these vesicles and how they would um, pinch off from the Golgi apparatus in order to um, have cells that would secrete things. And so this would kind of be an exocytosis. But we also have endocytosis, where the cells engulf substances into a pouch which becomes a vesicle. There are um, three different kinds. There's phagocytosis, penocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. And let's take a look at each of these. So here's just an example of the exocytosis where you have the secretory vesicle and the materials inside it that are going to be um, secreted from the cell or expelled from the cell. But the three methods of endocytosis here are illustrated. Um, here you've got um, where there is a material being brought into the cell and that's called phagocytosis 
And um, so phagocytosis could be um, in a white blood cell. Uh, this could be a bacteria or a virus. It could be um, food for an amoeba. Um, here you kind of see uh, an amoeba and uh, the vacuole forming. Um, and so it could be a food vacuole, but it also could be a destructive vacuole. Penocytosis is cell drinking, and it's when solutes are moved inside the cell. I'm using the same kind of um, enfolding of the bipolar plasma membrane. And here you have an example of many different cells that are bringing um, liquid into them. And then finally, you have receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, it's a specific form of phagocytosis where you've got a receptor proteins and... Um, the, uh, the coated pit, and um, so the molecules would bind to a receptor and they would be then internalized in the cell. And here's an example of a coated vesicle uh, or a coated pit that then becomes a coated vesicle. Now let's look for the uh, McGraw-Hill animation of this. The substances used as fuel by single-celled organisms include other smaller cells, particles of organic material, and large molecules that cannot pass through the plasma membrane. Many single-celled eukaryotes use a mechanism called endocytosis to ingest such food particles. In this process, the plasma membrane surrounds and engulfs the food particle. Cells use three basic types of endocytosis depending on the size and nature of the material to be ingested. Phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is particulate, such as a bacterial cell or an organic fragment, the process is called phagocytosis. If the material is a liquid, it is called pinocytosis. Some types of molecules, such as low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, are transported across the plasma membrane by receptor-mediated endocytosis. These molecules first bind to specific receptors embedded in the plasma membrane. The receptor molecules are concentrated in an indented pit coated by the protein clathrin. When sufficient target molecules accumulate in the coated pit, the pit deepens, seals, and is incorporated into the cell as a coated vesicle. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. This process results in the discharge of materials from membrane-bound packages that migrate to the inner surface of the plasma membrane, fuse with the membrane, and then release their contents to the outside of the cell. Let's take um, a few minutes now to finish this up, comparing facilitated transport with active transport. And then examine how exocytosis and endocytosis change the membrane surface area of the cells. And when you're finished with this, you can stop this video and move on to the next one.